Hi, everybody. My name is Raven Snook, and I'm the editor of Creative Content at TDF. Thank you so much for joining us for a conversation I'm really excited to be moderating about uh, comp theater companies that uh, are run by women plus. Uh, and we have three artistic directors here today from New York City companies. Um, just want to let you know my background. I'm a very gothy white woman uh, with a skull and rose headband wearing very red lipstick and I'm against an orange background. And uh, I guess, why don't we start with you, Julia? Hi, I'm Julia Greer. I, am, I use she, her pronouns and I am a white woman with brown hair, shoulder length against a gray background and have a pinkish sweater on. And I am the artistic director of the Hearth Theater Company. And I guess Rebecca? Oh, yeah. Hey, Rebecca Martinez, she, her pronouns. I, uh, I am a, um, a mixed race and mixed ethnicity Latina person. My skin is, is a lighter. I have a lighter complexion. My hair is brown and sort of curlyish. Uh, I'm wearing sort of like a navy blue top. And in the background, I have a couple of small pictures that my mother painted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the Associate Artistic Director at WP Theater, and I work there alongside the fantastic Producing Artistic Director, Lisa McNulty. And so Susan, your turn. I'm Susan Birdfield. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with brownish blonde hair and a great, I have a gray shirt on, and I'm, my background is kind of a blurry, frosted window situation. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to be here and talk about what you do. And, you know, my first question is really to find out how you became involved in the companies you're involved in. I know two of you co-founded your companies, or actually, I think, Susan, you may have founded it on your own. And Rebecca, you've come to WP Theater more recently. So, um, you know, whoever wants to go first, I don't want to have to call on you. I think we can, <laughs> we can figure this out. Who wants to jump in and talk about it? I mean, mine is probably shorter, so I could start. <laughs> I um, like I've, I, of course, being in the field and being a, a, a female identifying director, seeing WP and seeing the work at WP was always sort of like, oh, this is so cool. Look at all these cool works by women plus folks. And um, and of course, the lab was such a tremendous uh, just opportunity that I, I mean, I saw so many people go through the lab and just the list of folks that have been through the W, through WP's lab is just, is, is just like incredible, the leaders who have gone through there. And um, so I was in the lab in the, the, the 18, the 2018, 2020 lab, the lab of broken dreams is what I call it because we were supposed to do our pipeline festival in March of 2020. Oh. But then, um, I started working as the Associate Artistic Director then in July of 2020, another very exciting time <laughs> in the world of theater. So I've been connected with WP since 2018, a fan for much longer, but have been Associate Artistic Director since uh, July of 2020. And I, so it's actually, it feels very cool to be on this chat with these two uh, women because I, Emma Miller and I are co-founder, kind of, we went to college together. And when we were in college, we kind of started with this very simple feeling that like, why is everyone doing Hamlet? And why are all these awesome women actors not getting these parts that are interesting? And why are there no contemporary plays on campus by women? And so we sort of started there and we would actually go through the production history of WP and New Georges and look for plays like in places like the Kilroy's List because we were in rural Ohio and didn't have so many, uh, so much access to theater there outside of school. And then when Emma and I moved to New York, we felt like we wanted to create space for emerging uh, women and non-binary and trans and people of marginalized gender writers and uh, makers and designers and actors and directors. And so we sort of started from there with a play and have been going ever since. And that was in 2016, 2017. Cool. I think I didn't say what I, who I was or what I did. And I, <laughs> I don't think you myself, did either. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm the artistic director, producer of New Georges. So that's a more recent title. We've had a lot of different titles along the way, but I am a founder, although the people I originally founded the company with I was the only person crazy enough to really sort of 
I don't know, feel really responsible and keep it going. <laughs> um, it really was a bit of an accident um, that kind of changed my life. I was an actor and I just wanted to find plays to be in. And similarly to what Julia said, I went to the drama bookstore. I searched the shelves. I couldn't really find anything. I didn't know anything about new plays. And um, but I did realize that there must be people like me who were writing plays that maybe we would be able to find something to be in that felt a little bit richer than the other things that um, that were presented to us. Certainly when I was in drama school, the things that were presented to us were uh, not very exciting um, and, and not very, you know, there was really nothing to do or to be in. So that's, that's how we got started in 1992. And that kind of kept rolling. I obviously eventually learned to what a new play was and what new play processes were, but it was all very much um, trial and error, I think, and learning as I went along. But now I've been doing it for quite a long time. Um, and it's been, a, you know, an ever more enriching experience as more and more people are out there wanting to do exciting things. And we have so many more colleagues to refer to. And there is, I think, um, a, a vaster library of projects um, that are on the shelves and off the shelves, I hope, because I don't like reading plays on the page. I like them to be in 3D, um, to, to enrich our, all of our theater lives. So, you know, we've been talking about the issue of gender parity in theater for, it feels like since I was, before I was born. And, um, you know, there's always this sense of urgency around it. And I'm just curious to know, you know, do you, what do you think has gotten better and or has anything gotten better? I mean, obviously what you're doing is an indication of people wanting to make it better. And, you know, what's gotten better and maybe what's gotten worse. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It's better. It's so much better um, just because I, I feel like the pioneers, everything that happened at WP, now that we've been along so long, around for so long, uh, we have made it happen. And now there are several generations of playwrights to look to. When I started and I didn't have the internet, I had to actually go to the bookstore and there was no internet. Uh, it was very, very difficult to even know who was out there writing. I felt that or directing, certainly very, very few. Um, I could count the directors I knew of on one hand for sure, maybe not even the whole hand. And the playwrights, you know, very similarly. And most of the playwrights I knew who were early career playwrights, they had been actors um, and they sort of moved into that. But now, A, many people have the fancy, wonderful playwrights um, teaching them in school. And I run into women directors all the time who are like, I've wanted to be a director since I was 10. And that didn't exist. It didn't exist. There was not the model to go out and realize that you could have a life in the theater or have impact in the theater or that it even felt like a viable career path, I think, except for you know a few people who obviously, there's always some people. Um, so I think it's very different. At the same time, I think it makes it difficult in other ways because there are so many people and so few opportunities. And in our whole theater conversation, I think we're talking a lot about a lack of opportunity. We had, you know, a few years off and there's sort of a glut of stuff and that we have to make up for that time. Things are getting more expensive. I think it's increasing. So how do we support these people that we've encouraged to be incredible voices in our art form that feels to me like the challenge around the great thing um, of, of having people really feel like the opportunity is there yeah I, I think when um similarly similarly when i started in theater i was also an actor and i did a little bit of directing here and there on the side and i it, it took me a while to realize, it wasn't until I came to New York and I started applying for like things that were like New Georges and being part of the New Georges Jam and and uh, with WP Lab and these these incredible institutions that support women and trans non-binary folk. And uh, uh, it took me then to realize, oh, I've really only worked with men as directors, as artistic mm -hmm. directors and a lot as writers and it and it was like oh as soon as i started getting into rooms that were not cis men run i started to see there are different ways of working and um transformed my own directing style to like be true to myself in a way that felt uh just it, it just felt more organic which was uh, which was incredible but then um this is also making me think just a little bit we were saying susan we had a memorial for uh, the founder of WP, Julia Miles, at 
just maybe about a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And we had some of the folks there who were with Julia in the very early days of, you know, like 45 years ago and, and, and before of when the, and when the, like the building blocks were being put into place. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, oh, it was different. <laughs> it was very, very different and much, much more challenging. And so I just, you know, like I'm, I just constantly am grateful to, to those who came before and who put the things in place, even though it is, you know, still a long ways to go. There is a, you know, I am here because they were there first and just recognizing mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and I feel like very, yeah. And I feel similarly, I mean, I feel like we exist because WP and New Georgia's exist, but also I think to what Susan was saying, I think part of what we looked at was still this kind of, there's this lack of opportunity for any artists and wanting to push people who are women to the forefront of those opportunities and to show large institutions and places that that kind of work is viable and that that work is exciting and that more people should just have more opportunities to work. And that's an impossibility kind of right now, it feels like. But I think part of why we felt like we weren't redundant is trying to give more people opportunity uh, in this space, for sure. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about Women Plus and the fact that it's not just about putting women at the forefront anymore. There's been an evolution in the understanding of gender and gender identity. And I'm wondering how that's, you know, I, I think all three of your companies I've seen have been very inclusive. And I'm wondering how that impacted your mission and, and maybe how you work with artists. Yeah, I feel like for me, a kind of simple, oh, sorry, do you want to go? Sorry, I'm no. trying to let it be democratic. We'll figure <laughs> no, it out. I can call on people if you think it's just Julia. Yeah. Julia. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to say a short version, which is just that I think for me, it has been about evolving our language and mission statements to make sure we're including everyone who we want to include and not having language that accidentally excludes people that we are really excited about working with and feel deserve a place in our company. And I think that, I think... I, it's hard to do it without the negative of like, just no cis men. But I think that's sort of what we end up um, just not wanting to exclude anyone that we feel is included in our mission inherently. And that the, the, that language, making sure that that's expansive enough. Yeah, and I think that that word evolution is what it is in the, in the continuing evolving nature of it. And that we are not fixed. And every time we come up with that language, it ends up not being fixed. But I think that the really interesting thing that I realized um, in the last few years is that what we're really talking about is a non-patriarchal space. And so mm -hmm. now we're trying to say who's served by a non-patriarchal space. And I you know, have met countless cis women who are not served by a non-patriarchal space. So it isn't even, it, it becomes about something else. It becomes about the vibe and the community, which is really the grounding of our theater company is really about people coming together in community who are process oriented. And, um, and so that has become the really important thing. But I will say in terms of my um, longevity, that, that it, it, it has been a really interesting transition from in general, from our wanting to be sure that, to sort of push women forward into the world so that they would never have to say they're a women art, woman artist or a woman playwright or a woman director be, so they could just be an artist to a world now where identity is so much at the forefront. And there's so many wonderful things about that. At the mm. same time, it's really, I don't know, it, it, it has been a complex transition. Um, to not, not necessarily to open up to people who express their gender in all different ways, but to be feel like being at the front of that, the thing that we tried to suppress because that felt like how we could make our artists successful. Like if we, like a women's college, put you out into the world with some additional experience, then you won't have to face this, you're a woman thing, to no, 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 we're embracing that. And that still is, it's, it feels very, very, Yeah, and when Lisa came in to WP, she did a, a, a tremendous amount of work, similarly to what you were saying, Julia, about how to how to expand who we intentionally want to feel welcomed, and of expanding beyond just the idea of cis women, and to think about you know, how women's movements and feminist movements have been exclusive. Um, in in 
in many ways that was a positive, but in many ways that was a negative. And thinking about folks who had been excluded, who may have the identity markers of someone who is, is female identifying, but who may have felt excluded either because of race or ethnicity or the expansiveness is how they see their own genders. And so I think that like Lisa has just done tremendous work in doing that. And, and we're not finished, like we're, we're still learning and the language that we're using is imperfect and it doesn't embrace everybody. But I think one of the things that we've had folks from trans communities help us understand particularly that it isn't about how can we just make all the perfect language to fit absolutely everybody, but similarly to something that you were saying, Susan, about who feels like they are drawn to, to this type of space and who feels like they can find a home there. Those are folks that we want to, to feel welcome. So we want to like make sure like we got, we got our, our house in order so folks feel welcomed, but then specifically we're not trying to make it one size fits all. We are like literally, um, we want to, to, to make the welcome and those who feel the answer of, of that welcome to come. Um, and no, the, those, I mean, I love the idea of the non-patriarchal space who would be served by that. That's so interesting. And, and you know, in thinking of and using that language, um, where do you feel in, 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 you work with artists, not just women plus playwrights, but you really look to work with women plus artists all across the board, backstage, on stage with your companies. Is there, are there particular aspects of theater making that you feel that women plus are really underrepresented? Is it in playwriting? Is it in directing? Is it in design jobs? What have you found is where there's the least gender parity? I almost say technical jobs, yeah. mm -hmm. production. There's a lot of particularly uh, building and crew is, is where I think probably one of the biggest issues with parity that I've seen mm -hmm. and leadership. Leadership so, yeah. in Execu terms of- Executive leadership yeah. is I guess what I'll say. Mm -hmm. And I would say a way that we sometimes think about it and talk about it is that people just inherently bring their personhood to a project. And so if we can try to combine people in a project that their perspective is going to be unique to them and their identity. And so we really care a lot about who is involved in every project, just kind of like a side answer. But I do think like, I don't think it's as easy as just like pairing the right gender people with the right projects. It's like really people's perspectives and experiences. And I think like having a woman designer on a play bring something to it that is different than um, a male designer, just as an example. I know that there's a nonprofit called Obit's Open Stage Project that's trying to close the gender gap in backstage jobs. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, you know they work with high schoolers. And I mean, full disclosure, I know this because my my daughter works with them. So, but oh, it's cool. you know it is very interesting. It's yeah. It's, you know, she's going to costume shops and, you know, going to um, set design shops and seeing the construction end, not just the design end, but what you were saying, Rebecca, like really like the hands-on construction end. So, um, you know, going back to onstage representation, now in a lot of mainstream, I mean, Broadway productions, there's a lot of what people would say is gender swapped or gender bent or gender blind, depending on the perspective casting. And I was just curious if that's something you're a fan of and if there are examples you've really loved or if there are things you really haven't liked. I mean, you, you've you spent your careers trying to make new work for women plus artists. This is different. This is taking classics like Julia, you mentioned, you know, why is everybody doing Hamlet? But now they do Hamlet with women. They do King Lear with women. So I was curious if they, if that's a trend that you like, uh, if you think it furthers the work in general, or if that's something you haven't been a fan of. I think that if there's a reason for whatever artist is instigating that project, yeah. Um, yeah. What's the vision behind it would be my question, I think, more than kind of slapping that together, I don't, I haven't really thought about it that much, actually. Uh, but, but I think that the, to me, it's about you know who's who's at the helm, and um, and and why do they want to use that method of expression? Who you put on the stage, no matter what 
context you're doing a classical or a, a, um, just a repeated I don't know what to call it, um, piece that isn't new, you want to have a reason for it. And so I'm curious, especially if it's a woman at the helm, what they're, why they're doing that. And, Yeah, I think specifically, oh. like being right in it, I'm working on a, um, a musical adaptation of Comedy of Errors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's not fully like, hey, this is all women or anything like that, but allowing, um, there are some roles for women traditionally or not traditionally because no women were acting at that time. <laughs> but uh, so women characters, I guess is what I would say. And so just thinking about, to me, it, in, in some ways, it is, okay, we just can't have this be all men. We're just not going to do it. Uh, and, but then in other ways, it is, there are some, like, juicy, juicy roles in classical plays. And how fun it is to be able to have someone who has the chops be able to dive into that, regardless of gender. So I think in, in one way it is to expand the amount of roles that people can play. And the other thing is like, what does it mean to have, um, to, to have a, a, a person who identifies as female, you know, taking on a role like Richard III or Henry Bott, you know, like one of those that we've, or Hamlet, or, you know, like one of those we have traditionally seen as like male dominating. And, and it, to me, it is just interesting of, um, just expanding perspectives on it, as well as, you know, some are finding like greater stories that can be told specifically uh, with that type of cast casting. So no, not opposed to it at all. I think it's very useful. I think it can be very, very fun. But again, yeah, it is like, what story are you trying to tell? And I, I think the thing that, that gets tricky is when it's random like what is this, yeah. the specificity behind it and what is the reasoning behind it feels important. Yeah, I would agree. I agree with both of those things. I, and I think, I do think it just comes to thought. And also if you put someone in that role, how does the rest of the production shaped around that I think is important and to not just totally just do that and be like the whole play is that way. I don't know. I think you have to sort of think about the whole repercussions of it just because it does change, not repercussions in a negative way, but it just changes dynamics and it changes power structures. And I think that's so interesting to play with, but I like it when it's really thoughtful. And um, this, you know, a lot of theater makers don't like to talk about awards and I understand why, uh, but there, you know, there's been this interesting question brought up about getting rid of gendered categories and some awards are doing that. And, um, you know, the argument for it is pretty obvious. It's more inclusive. It's the idea of, you know, honoring the best if it's two women and, you know, not a woman, a man, great, or it's one woman and a trans person, et cetera. But the argument against it is of course, that there's this worry that there'll be a default to men dominating everything. So I was curious if this is something you've thought about or if this is applicable to anything else in the work that you do, where if you're not having sort of quotas that you worry that representation will get skewed. I mean, I guess I'll say that I've always had to think about representation at every project that I've ever worked on. There isn't a single project that I like, and no one's calling me up to be like, do whatever you, you like, I always have to think about representation. <laughs> and and I, I think about like, if there is a greater percentage of roles for men, say cis men specifically, I, I understand why it is, and it makes total sense. But I also, I, I do think that if the roles are stacked higher in the male category, then that could very easily lead to more awards in that direction without a very intentional, thoughtful group of folks who are keeping in mind parity as they're thinking about this. So whether it's like spoken or not spoken, it has to be an intention, I feel. I agree with that. And I think it it seems random to make that split until you think about who is making the work. And I and that is a place where I feel like we might not be there yet 
in terms of the quantity of roles that are on the stages of, of you know, whichever category this, any particular award is from. And until there's enough to sink people's teeth into, I'm not sure how that that can be equalized. Otherwise, you know, it is silly, um, but maybe it's not. So I, I don't know, I've never thought about that either. So, <laughs> but it is, an, it is a huge question that, um, I think the foundational work that all, that we're all doing is intended to create the kinds of repercussions that make that innocuous. Um, but we're not. Yeah. I would agree. It feels a little scary to open up the whole, the whole in that way, just because of where we are in terms of representation, just with roles. But I, I do feel like it's important for categories to not be exclusive. Um, and that I wonder if there's some gray area in that that could be improved sooner. But I don't want to have to think about that. <laughs> that feels like a huge thing to think about that I, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I have to say, that's one where I was like, I see both sides. And I think, <laughs> yes. but I think you're to your point that you have to fix the underlying problem, right? The underlying problem with parity and representation. Once that's fixed, then it's easy. So, um, but of course, that's the hard thing to fix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the hard work is, that you're doing. But it um, is a useful, you know, I think it feels like a really useful confrontation. I mean, pardon me, conversation. My next thought was going to be until it becomes more of a confrontation. These things, it, it, it's they feel so fraught often for very good reasons, um, and and so it, it just makes it a little bit harder, I think, to really look at every aspect of that and not and with nuance. Um, so that I think becomes a concern because otherwise, it, just talking about it even right now, it just feels very very productive to think about what all the issues are. And so I have a question that I hope doesn't bring up like horrible and, and we can totally skip it. But I wanted to ask because I think it could be funny stories or tra traumatic stories. You never know. <laughs> but, you know, when, when I was coming up with questions, I thought I'd love to hear like the most outrageous in instance of sexism that you felt that you faced in, in the theater industry. If there was a particular anecdote that illustrates maybe why you're so inspired to keep going with the companies that you work with. And you can pass. I won't be upset if everybody passes. <laughs> well, mine was very early on. It was very early on. I went to drama school at Circle in the Square. And we had this one class with the artistic director at that time of Circle in the Square, a very old school man, uh, where it was a, a class where we did a show. We did one play all together. And he would basically cast it for every every class session. He would cast it anew, and he would cast it based on who was just sitting in the classroom and be like, "You come here, play this part." And he called me Tom. I had short hair, and so he thought I looked like a boy. And he said that with short hair, you can never be an actress. Was one thing, but then he just would call me Tom. And he'd say, "Tom, come play this. Let's do it with Tom." Wow. <laughs> But I have, you know, I see, I live in my own little bubble, so I don't, I don't feel like I necessarily or notice a lot of the rest of it, which is fortunate for me, like very, very, I think. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been pretty lucky that I've worked with some, I mean, you know, dudes, but like lovely, generous, <laughs> respectful dudes, mostly. Um, I did have an artistic director early in my days who... Uh, used to call me hun and babe and uh, would comment on my body and times when like I would wear a bodysuit on stage because I, I, you know, I started as a dancer and those sort of things and I was like that's not cool no 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 you don't get to talk about my body I'm sorry you do not get to talk about my body and the hun and babe or maybe the babe stopped but the hun still continued which I'm like all right that's fine it can be familiar or whatever whatever but it, it there is there was sort of like a even though it was it was given in a very friendly way it had the feeling of um of hierarchy like very clear hierarchy of where my status is and even though i felt respected as being able to make artistic choices there was still a hierarchy so i was like yeah I don't, I don't need that i don't need that 
Yeah, I feel very like I very purposely created a life that deals with this the least possible. But uh, I will say when you said I first thought of it's a while ago, but in high school, I we had this like high school drama teacher who was like the only real director I ever knew. And he was this kind of cult of personality guy who like we did the crucible and he coached girls to have panic attacks. And there was this kind of like power trip. I'm laughing. It's not funny. <laughs> I mean, it, it's fun. it's absolutely deranged, but he was so, I just remember, I didn't have the words, but I just remember feeling like it was so male and such this power trip and so like inappropriate use of people's love of theater and wanting to do theater and community. And I think I, that was kind of the first time that I was like, I wonder, I had never experienced it, but I was like, I wonder what it would feel like mm -hmm. for this world to be led by women instead of men and I think that was like a formative feeling for me. And that segues nicely into I wanted to ask about who have been your heroes and I think you've already spoken about a few of them today uh, but you know who inspired you to look for this space in theater? I mean I was a very lucky uh, right out of college gal who my first real job was working for Paula Vogel and she oh, wow. <laughs> and that was like I mean I it's the luckiest thing that's ever happened to me but I think she as an entry into professional theater was a pretty remarkable hero to get to work with and learn from and I think she completely shaped everything that I thought think about theater and the community around it and that was a very lucky lucky thing. I I worked with early early in my career with Olga Sanchez, who's a director who is now around a lot of places, but was in Seattle at that time. And she was one of the only female directors that I worked with. And just her in and I, I developed a relationship with her. Um, both as an artistic director as, uh, of work I was directing and writing. So we, we had a very uh, multidimensional relationship. And the thing that I just valued so much is just like her rigor. Like it, it isn't like, oh, because you're female, you're not rigorous in your work. You know, like that's ridiculous. Like I know people have, have said that in the past, not so much now. But she was very rigorous in her artistic work but had, was the first one that I remember saying in a rehearsal room when we were like, well, what, is, what do we do with this? And she would say, I don't know. Let's wait and figure it out together. And like, that was so refreshing to me that, oh, we don't have to have the answer right now. We can leave space for discovery. When I thought directors, oh, oh, you know, a lot of directors are like, here's the answer, here's the answer, here's the answer. Mm -hmm. And realizing that there was such a different approach. So she's someone that, that early on really shaped um, my my interest and hunger to be in, in um, yeah, just different spaces. Wow, that's, this is a very, I don't know, complex question for me because I don't, I feel like I have things where I can look back and see influence, but I don't, again, I, it felt so lonely sort of coming up and not knowing anything about the thing that eventually I did. But finding heroes later or in the moment was a lot harder. But I will say that, um, you know, the one playwright when I was younger who we sort of did know about was Wendy Wasserstein. And when I was in high school, my mom, where she found, she would just be like, play, you know, she'd pick <laughs> things up and be like, this is a play and you like plays. Um, a, a copy of Uncommon Women and Others. And I went and I took it to high school and I we read it and it had like words in it that weren't usually in plays. And it was really, and structurally, you know, it was so peculiar and it was also about people like me. And when I think now about, you know, what I was saying earlier about not really feeling very unconscious about representation or why we should care about it, which I think I, even though I was raised by feminist men, I always considered myself that my expectation was so low about the theater, you know, when there were no scenes to be in in drama school or just you got two lines and the dude had a thousand lines. I was like, that's just plays, you know, that's just plays. But I had that one play where it's about young women and, um, and that was a pretty big deal. And so I always felt like following Wendy um, throughout those early years because, 
you know, she was the superstar. She was the one. Uh, no, that's great. And, um, you know, obviously we meet heroes all along the way. I'm sure there'll be many more you'll meet and yes. many more you could come up with if this were, <laughs> you know, we didn't have a time limit. Um, and if I guess I'm going to wrap up with a couple questions. One is just if you could instantaneously change something about the industry, what would, you know, that would help what you do? What would it be? Don't don't worry about whether it's realistic. I'm just asking if it was one thing. I think that there is a lot of, and especially now, excellent, excellent mm, complaint is understanding that the way that we've been working is difficult, um, ways to change our world, many, many, many things. And they're all talked about as if theaters can just do these things magically. And the thing that is forgotten is that funding allows us to do these things. That we actually need money to make a more humane work week and to have um, parenting be responded to and to have things be looser and to do fewer of whatever it is. And that, um, that funding is going away in many, many of these circumstances. It's not meeting the moment that's being asked for. And so theaters are expected, it's theater, you know, I just, I don't know, I see too many conversations on Twitter, whatever. theater is doing this, theater is doing that, but it's not, I, it shouldn't be that economic a model. A theater can have the values, and I don't know that everyone, I can't say that everyone is trying to put their values in the right place, but the support, if people are having those values and are able to articulate them, the support should be there for the values. And because the support isn't there, the values that we all want to see put in place or, or understood or enfranchised essentially are stuck because the model is, has to be so responsive to the funding. And, um, and I feel like I'm seeing that more abjectly than ever um, in so many ways. And I just feel a responsibility not to get people, including myself, off the hook for anything, but to understand that we are in a system we're trying to change and that there's an additional layer of support that is required in order to do it. It's not magic or nonprofits. It's a really nonprofit. It's a very, very problematic system. But that's where we are in this country, and and that's and so I really we're really trying to advocate for funding for everything because it's just very hard. Yeah, I that was very eloquently said. But I my gut reaction was money and funding, and I think it goes down to even spaces where we are able to perform and places that can provide a model that is actually reasonable to like i the hearth is a very small company and i we have a real real limit to what we can do and it's hard when it feels financially near impossible every single time we put up a play and i just and also structurally and mission wise it's like it feels really important to be evolving and changing and it feels hard to do that without funding genuinely as Susan said so well yeah I the first thing that came to mind I was interviewing for a directing job and one of the folks in the interview who is a veteran actor of many years asked about my um, tone in the rehearsal room and asked if I, you know basically this is paraphrasing like do you get angry and when you get angry what do you do do you throw things? Do you push things around? And I was like, what? What has happened to you? Because um, that was a very important question. And all I could think of was like, oh, this kind of behavior is rewarded because this poor actor has been through this for 20 some years and that is a norm, that that is such a norm that, that they had to ask that question. And so I would say, in addition to everything that Julia Susan said, I would wave my magic wand to get rid of a culture that rewards toxic and abusive leadership. And just be like, no, let's reward people first leadership and 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 spaces that are um that allow folks to be healthy and full and like the culture has to allow that 
And so it, it yeah, yeah. Anyway, well. that is, I'm just so floored. What? I mean, I know that we have <laughs> <Not> patriarchal space. <laughs> I mean, there is that mythos of you know the 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 abusive director getting the great work, which is a mm. load of bunk. But I can't believe they'd ask that because I don't even think those people would admit to that behavior. <laughs> I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. <laughs> Would Bob Fosse have admitted to his behavior if he were asked, do you do this? Yeah, I don't know. I'd be like, oh, totally, I throw chairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is how I get you to do your work. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and I want on a more uplifting note, I wanted to, to close, and but I'm going to ask you if there's anything that you want to talk about. I haven't, you know, there's so many different you know, we haven't even talked about intersectionality. I very purposefully wasn't doing that just because we would be talking for another five hours, but obviously we can a bit if, if that's something you want to. But first I wanted to talk about what uh, each of your companies has coming up soon. I know Julia, the hearth has a show coming up. I believe WP Theater isn't doing other main stage show till the spring, uh, but that you have other things going on. And I don't actually know, Susan, what your company is doing. I did look, but I didn't see anything. So I know, I know. Um, we're fine. Finally, doing uh, in 2023 the show we were supposed to do in the fall of 2020, but we also have another piece that is coming up in December that it just isn't. There. So what we we in December um, we have been working with the creator Miranda Heyman on a piece featuring their alter ego Bibi Brecht. So oh, I love that. Bibi Brecht uh, Yuletide Spectacular, oh. uh, and then Bibi Brecht is going to the Under the Radar Festival. And then uh, in the spring, we're um, producing with the Movement Theater Company, a uh, mm. play that we call The Cotillion for short. It has a very long name, uh, which is incredible. It's a black, black debutante ball culture, and it is written and directed by Colette Robert and began in a program of ours called The Audrey Residencies. And we've been working on it for a very, very, very long time. And we're very, very, very excited that it is finally going to be happening in May at the Art North Theater. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we're doing uh, a play by Bailey Williams, directed by Sarah Blush, called Events at the Brick, which is a wonderful, wonderful space in Williamsburg. And we start, we're in rehearsals right now, and performances start December 1st through 18th. That's a wild, yeah. fun time. <laughs> yeah. We have um, in the spring uh, our, our co production with Playwrights Horizons which is Julie Isami's regretfully so the birds are directed by Jenny Coons so that's that's it's it's a wild play and it's going it's just going to be amazing and fun and then watch the WP space soon because there may be another announcement coming mm -hmm. just going to say this is what <laughs> I can say <laughs> And in wrapping up, so, you know, obviously, like I said, there are a million things we could talk about, but if you feel like there's some huge topic that I missed, I would love to hear, you know, what you'd like to talk about. Well, I just want to say that I, I, the thing that keeps me in it is community and knowing everyone and the intersection of everyone and Julia's project or two, New Georgia's artist, Rebecca is New Georgia's artist, Julia Izumi is a New Georgia's artist. And it's wonderful that we all get to share the wealth and that hope, and hopefully for artists feeling as well supported by our whole ecosystem, which now exists, is, is what makes things happen. And it can't happen without living in this ecosystem of, of talking to each other and knowing each other and being able to really, really, really support each other in order to support artists as well. So that is so great. We're so lucky. Yeah, and I would say that um, there, there's a few generations of institution here on this call, which is amazing and exciting. And thinking of like, it, it, oh, that's enough. No, that's not enough. It is. It, it there is space for more. Mm -hmm. We can make a build bigger table with more seats. And even though things are a little rocky in the theater industry right now, theater is going to continue, and it may look a little different, but it will continue. And so I think just keeping that that uh, mindset of abundance and we there is enough. There is enough so that we can we can have. Um, so that we can have parity. Yeah. 
Do you have anything to add, Julia? I don't know. I'm trying to, I don't, they both said things so beautifully. I do, I feel very aware of kind of being the, the, the newest addition to the ecosystem. I'm sure there are people actually that are younger than me that are newer and I'm excited to know them, but I do, I feel so grateful for people like Susan and Rebecca and places that I think it's been such a wonderful surprise to me living in New York that can feel like a big scary place, how much community there is. And I think women and women plus artists especially love to share the community in a way that I find really uh, amazing and exciting. And I just hope it continues to grow as Rebecca said. Yeah. It's too hard otherwise. And yeah. I think that there's no reason not to share the hard won information and, and things that we, we all can share with each other. So. Absolutely. Good. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time and, and really giving such thoughtful answers. And, you know, I'm so excited to see all the stuff you do next. And um, yeah, I hope you had fun. And you all, did you all know each other? You've all met before. That's good. In one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, so email or just, person or I whatever. I think that oh, just underscores what you said, Julie, about the community and the fact that, you know, there is this overlap and it's a supportive overlap, not a competitive one, which is really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.